I'm glad that you spoke briefly about the term called middle class. Sure. And um, in the past few years, I have realized that uh, for Indians, for middle class Indians, for lower middle class Indians, there are three asymmetric bets that they can play in life. If they want to skyrocket their career, sure. Uh, that becomes political consulting. Okay. When you work with bureaucrats, then it becomes policy consulting. You are right, partially. You could work with politicians as well, and you could do policy consulting as well. Yeah. But most of the times, if you are working with ministers, a larger chunk of your work tend to be around elections, tend to be around your speeches. So this is the first aspect. Now let's come to the very interesting part. So let's assume that I made many mistakes in my life. in class 12th i was chilling i was uh, not studying well and eventually ended up getting into let's say dauduram college of engineering and now later in in second year or third year i realized there's there's something called management consulting it pays a lot it also allows me to work across disciplines sure. it also allows me to build a great alumni network and learn skills so on and so forth now i have already made the mistakes <laughs> i'm not from a target school sure. that will let land me into the world of consulting sure this podcast is for those who are afraid to tell their parents that government jobs are not for me i am made for different things in life this podcast is a must watch for anyone who has ever thought of appearing for an exam called the upsc civil services but for some reason they do not find the motivation This podcast is for those who want to work in management consulting, public policy, or international relations, but they do not know if their undergraduate degree qualifies for it or not. This podcast is also for those who are stuck in the quagmire of appearing and reappearing for government jobs in India, and for those who believe that getting a government job will be the only way to live a successful life. Because in this podcast. We are going to discuss all the career opportunities that you may not have even heard of, but now those opportunities will transform every facet of your life, from working in the UN to working in BCG to launching your own startup. There are a million things that you can do, but sadly, no one knows how to do them. No one knows the skill sets that they need to thrive in this very unique world. This podcast will demystify every aspect of your career's journey, and I mean this. So, if you are dazed, or if you are confused, and if you think that you have no guidance, watch through this podcast with astute patience and calmness. Because whether you like it or not, government jobs are not the only means through which you can attain upward social mobility in modern day twenty first century. The world has dramatically changed. India has also changed along with it. Some of the aspects of this podcast are going to be controversial. Take the snippets that work best for you. The entire podcast is laced with tricks, tips and hacks that only a few privileged had access to up until today. So please watch this podcast end to end. There will be moments when you would feel like dropping off, but please do not. Save it and watch it later. Watch for 15 minutes every day in multiple time slots if concentration is an issue for you because this podcast is going to be transformational for you In the last 8 years alone approximately 220 million indians had applied to get a sarkari naukri to put into perspective that is the combined population of four largest countries in europe and out of those 220 million indians 99% failed to get into those jobs but that is not the problem the problem is how much of india's talent is now getting wasted in the quest to get these government jobs The most powerful story that is narrated across all families in India is the story of government jobs. The story has been played out in our minds by our parents, our neighbors, and movies in effect our entire society. You cannot be from middle class or low middle class Indian family if you have not flirted with the idea to prepare for government jobs in India. 
Millions of Indians take the arduous multi-year journey of frustration, anxiety, desperation, depression with the hope of one day securing a job that provides them stability. And in that arduous journey they lose their entire youth. They lose the energy and in many cases they also lose themselves. They cloister themselves in tiny rooms in Delhi without realizing that there is life beyond exams in their 20s. This podcast is for all those who now want to come out of that rat race of government jobs. There's a life beyond exams and it is high time that young India experience that life because that life is a real life. That life is not easy. There will be moments in that life where you will fall, you will fail, you will get frustrated, but that life will provide you freedom. You will acquire new skill sets, you will meet new people, you will acquire new experiences. and those experiences will shape a new life for you welcome to the season 1 of the money heist podcast in this podcast i'm absolutely delighted to welcome shatakshi sharma who will share her experiences of how she got incredible opportunities in life and how she built an incredible career for herself where she worked with government of india with leaders of management consulting firms such as mckinsey and bcg and also advised foreign governments as an advisor to the former uk prime minister Mr. Tony Blair. Katakshi will also explain how you can also build a career in the management consulting in the world of public policy in the world of international development and product management. These are some of the most high profile careers in the private sector and there are instances legit instances when many civil servants had quit their jobs to reestablish a career in these fields. Hi Shatakshi, thank you so much for taking out time for my podcast Money Heist. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, Naman. Thank you so much for inviting me. The honor is all mine, and congratulations for all the great work you are doing with your YouTube channel. A lot of followers and a lot of community members, I suppose, will be able to learn so much from your own uh, journey. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me again. Absolutely. The purpose is simple: to provide unfiltered, very well-researched views on the topics that we are passionate about. And in the podcast of Money Heist, we would want to cover many aspects and facets of career, but more so about the lifestyle. Because in the rat race of investing and thriving and doing so many things in the hustle culture, we forget sometimes to live a life. So in this podcast, I look forward to learning many of the facets of your life, but more so about the world of the beautiful world of management consulting. Sure. So Shataksh, a few months ago, I was at Stanford. and uh, during my time there other than the wonderful food we also stumbled upon uh, the speeches given by mitt romney the former us politician and i was astonished to find out that he is a bain consultant he is an explainer correct yeah and exact and a few months ago i think one of our fellows at gji she was interviewed by by jayan sena the former mos of finance correct. in india for the osd position and it turns out he was an he was a mckinsey consultant correct indra nui is a bcg consultant and what i'm realizing is that doesn't matter whether you are leading countries or leading geographies or leading businesses these people have one thing in common a background in consulting sure so in this uh, podcast we'll talk about various facets of the world of management consulting public policy policy consulting social impact consulting so on and so forth and who would be the better person to do this with than of course you because you oh, have right. in some way or the other touched various aspects of your consulting journey in past 10 years sure so off to you introduce yourself and um, tell us your story sure uh, like i said naman it's a very interesting topic Uh, many management consultants tend to do really very well and uh, not all of them and i think that logic applies to any industry in any sector uh, having said this management consulting is a very good training institute uh, and with that happy to start my journey so i was born in india of 1991 i typically say this it is when the india got its second independence so the liberalization era i was born into a family where my grandfather was uh, a farmer by profession in western uttar pradesh my father in fact uh, was born and brought up in a village in uttar pradesh he actually through hard work through sheer effort got into a public sector unit in india yeah. uh, he was the primary bread uh, winner and earner in the family my mother is a homemaker she played a great deal in teaching me kindness and empathy through not just words but actions as well mm-hmm. uh, on 
regular dinner table conversations our marks our grades were spoken about i am that quintessential sharma ji ki beti who would yeah. uh, many a times come second with 95 percentage and my father would ask but why not first uh, i am not sure where does this level of competitiveness came in me but i was very competitive child since since early on yeah. my parents never had to follow up about grades with me then i had to never follow up about homework with me mm-hmm. um, in fact i was pretty competitive to make sure that i was taking extra homework from my classroom teachers so if anyone is watching me i am that uh, student that perhaps many of you despised during your uh, childhood so are these quintessential students who end up becoming consultants yes or no maybe i don't know but uh, Uh, i think there is certain level of intellectual rigor and certain level of grades that are required as well to get into management consulting so maybe i think there is certain level of nerdiness which is pretty common in management consultants so you could say that uh, but of course there are outliers as well so my father actually taught me uh, till 10 standard uh, i never took coaching classes outside my father was pretty strong in teaching me and in fact i think it's his teaching genes that i picked up uh, later on as well Uh, my elder brother played a very strong role in guiding me that for example not to take engineering but to sign up for st stephen's college as a fact that i got good grades uh, st stephen's college made way more sense than any other engineering college in india he wanted the best for his uh, younger sister yeah. uh, he was the one interestingly who introduced me to the world of management consulting he said now that you're going to st stephen's college a lot of interesting consulting firms will hire mm-hmm. so college undergrad in delhi living in residence of st stephen's college completely changed my outlook yeah. for the first time in life uh, i met people who were not running after grades for the first time in life i met people for example in st stephen's college it is pretty common 50 percentage of the cohort does not even sit for placements mm-hmm. and i was just really surprised in fact till date in india if you go to a premium tier because one because preparing for civil services right not really a uh, few of them are uh, it's a declining curve but i think a lot of them are preparing for second for their masters okay and uh, that culture of just a rat race is relatively less in that college that left a very strong impression upon me for the first time in my life uh, i got delhi university rank 1 in my first year mm-hmm. and i say this very often i was barely passing in my till the time i third year it's not that i uh, like in parents language ki ladki bigad gayi that's not what happened so in your first year you got university rank 1 gold medal yes and in the third year what was the situation so if i were to talk freely about it even if my father ends up watching it in i think st stephen's college you can sit for exams only if you have 80 percentage attendance in my first year i was i think somewhere around 98 percentage attendance in my uh, third year i was somewhere around 82 percentage attendance i was kind of freaking out but i think i started over indexing is this because is because at st stephen's in some way or the other your ranks or your marks decide whether you get the the the, the university accommodation Oh that's true it's not because of that okay. i got lucky so um, if in first year i didn't get residence of college i was in a paying guest but then what happened was because i was so desperate and i wanted to live on campus to immerse myself and those were the best two years of my life uh, because i was university rank 1 i got uh, advantage for the two seats that had opened up they went to university ranks um, so it must did help me eventually but like i said I got a lot of shortlist in St Stephen's College because of my good marks yeah. but I got very few converts I just converted one management consulting offer and I'm just really lucky about that but marks did allowed me to reach till a place but there was way more than marks and I think St Stephen's taught me that I met a lot of people my best friends were from Assam were from Srinagar they were studying history they were studying psychology so coming up from in a family where most of them were engineers mm-hmm. to moving to a background in delhi where liberal arts was actually in majority yeah. and science students were in minority where in morning assemblies a uh, pro- our dean was saying that get experiences not for cv but for the heck of getting experiences mm-hmm. early on at an age of 18 left a very strong impression upon me to over is he the same dean who didn't let one of the famous cricketers play the game for the university attendance unfortunately yes okay. he's pretty notorious we can debate about a lot of other things uh, yeah so he got into a lot of limelight because of attendance let's talk about the experiences how he sure. promoted those sorry let's talk about the experiences how did he optimize for those few things such as club activities i was the secretary of hiking club 
uh, that meant that after my laboratory work in chemistry, so I studied chemistry at St. Stephen's College, I was going, uh, it's a famous wall in St. Stephen's College where you could hike. I was part of the dancing club as well. And if I were to be very candid, I was just chatting with my friends in similar lawns like this of St. Stephen's College till 8 p.m. I was living on residence, so I was pretty sorted, but my friends were Delhiites, so they had to go late. So, I, and many times I say this to youngsters as well, who are just so anxious, so stressed about their careers, who are already putting in 14, 15 hours, and I've done that. But today, for example, at an age of 31, I do not have the luxury of surrounding myself with friends who are as free uh, as we were back then and just chat about everything and anything under the sun for hours. Mm -hmm. So we were doing that. It's a very famous saying, for example, in college that saying, Stephanians don't move out of campus. Okay. We even actually never felt the need for moving out of campus because we were just finding ourselves. We were talking about ideologies. We were talking about theories. We were uh, talking to professors from philosophy department so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So those were the rich experiences. We were in our cocoon, you could say that. It was a safe world. Yeah. Uh, the, the real world had not touched us yet. Mm -hmm. The corporate world, if I were to say so. But I have very fond memories of my time when I just let myself be free, caref and I was really carefree mm -hmm. for the first time in my life and perhaps the only time in my life as well because the life caught on to me after I graduated from college. Oh, that's phenomenal. So, Shatakshi, I want this podcast to be a primer for consulting. So, there are many youngsters who are confused about the world. And fortunately and unfortunately, there's a lot of information already on the internet. Sure. And with a lot of information comes a lot of irrelevance. Correct. And a lot of irrelevant information. So, I want this entire podcast to be about, you know, if, if someone is very young, let's say that I, I just got into St. Stephen's. I'm 18 or I'm 19, I'm very lazy. I want to spend a lot of my time in the gardens. I want to chill with my professors, discuss philosophy. But at the same time, I also want to work with McKinsey sure. or BCG. Sure. How can I efficiently do that? Sure. And before we talk about how, let's talk about what is management consulting? Sure. I believe that's a really good question because there are multiple parts to it and I will give anecdotes also of friends, peers and seniors who got into McKinsey, BCG and Bain. I got into boutique consulting. I was shortlisted, reached final stage but couldn't really crack it back then. Could you then. explain what is boutique consulting, what sure. is MBBs and what is consulting? Sure. Yeah. So management consulting is basically a method of advising the Fortune 500s of the world through data and through research. And people who typically do that are partners who have spent a decade in certain industry mm -hmm. with the support of associates and young consultants who bring in a lot of fresh perspective coupled with a lot of data. So what really happens is if you pick up Reliance in India or if you pick up Walmart, right? What really happens is these people get information asymmetry because they lack fresh perspective. They're just dealing with the same information, same ecosystem since long. So they lack fresh perspective. That's problem number one. Problem number two, when organizations get big at that level of Amazon and Walmart, mm -hmm. then information asymmetry at a department level also sets in. Mm -hmm. So finance guy will solve for finance, operations guy will solve for operations, marketing folks, so on and so forth. And the third thing is lack of quality data within the organization and outside of the organization. Because of such problems with information and expertise, CEOs and CXOs struggle to take really good quality and precise decision. And at that level, one decision could gone wrong, could cost you millions and crores. Yeah. So management consultants come in and bring more efficiency into the ecosystem mm -hmm. through much more precise decisions and recommendations followed and backed by a lot of hardcore data analysis and research. That's the world of management consulting. And when these consultants go on to advise political leaders, sure. does this become policy consulting? Uh, that becomes political consulting. Okay. When you work with bureaucrats, then it becomes policy consultants. Uh, you are right partially. You could work with politicians as well and you could do policy consulting as well. Yeah. But most of the times if you're working with ministers, a larger chunk of your work tend to be around elections, tend to be around your speeches, tend to be around how to come into next elections, etc. Which is the political consulting work. Uh, in my experiences, a larger chunk of policy consulting takes place with the uh, bureaucrats and the administrative officers. So that's policy consulting. So when Sun Tzu was doing his consulting? Art of war, yes. Was he doing a policy consulting or management consulting? 
I believe he was so managed policy consulting is a subset of management consulting. Okay. It will be safe for me to say that he was doing management consulting. So he was the first of many McKinsey consultants. Correct. You could, BCG consultant. I would say that he was first before even the era of management consulting started and I really like that example. If you notice on the word management, yeah. right? Anything to deal with management which is strategy and less execution, right? And now of course operation and execution consulting takes place. Mm -hmm. Anything to do with CEOs and CXOs is basically management consulting. Hence the word management consulting. Yeah. Because you ask the word what is boutique consulting? Boutique consulting is basically startup and management consulting combined. Which is that in most of the cases in boutique consulting, you don't solve for everything and anything. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you will be able to survive as a boutique consultant. So you either pick up a sector or industry. Mm -hmm. For example, Parthenon, e, uh, EY Parthenon and LEK, mm -hmm. they are doing educational consulting. Yeah. Right? Uh, there are other policy consulting firms as well who are just doing governance consulting. Okay. So in a world where MBB is doing everything and anything, mm -hmm. and they are pretty darn good deal at that one, uh, boutique consulting. That's debatable. Sure. I don't know if you've read this recently published book I'm on aware. the McKinsey's, McKinsey's way, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. In but fact, go on. E economist came up with an article about the efficiency of management consultants as well. Mm -hmm. We can debate that and I've had my own experiences about really good, impactful work where I felt there was impact. And there were few projects where I personally had uh, those conundrums and those struggles where are we really creating the impact or is this just pure play strategical work? But it it could be just either of those, but yeah. it will be, and without any biases, I think it will be wrong to say that management consultants don't add value. Had it been the case, the industry would have not survived for more than 100 years. Yeah. Um, and it, for example, in BCG's case, 80% of the clientele is a repeat client. Mm -hmm. That means that for your first time and your second time, you would have done really good impactful work. Hence, clients are paying you recurrently well. And that's the case with McKinsey and Bain and any other client in B2B management consulting. You get repeat business. So you would have done, nobody is a fool to pay you bomb yeah. to do repeat business, right, uh, with them. But uh, if we were to say it's 100% impactful, of course not. There could be, and that's with every industry, mm -hmm. right? The only challenge is advisory at times could be, could be, it's a thin line on which you work. So, yes, that's what my answer is about the world of management consulting. Yeah. We'll go into the, the, the sure. relevance and irrelevance sure. of, of consulting. You in, seem to have biases. In time to come. Sure. Uh, but as of now, uh, the question is that I got into St. Stephen's. Sure, yes. And I'm chilling. Sure. I'm having all the momos. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm discussing philosophies while having those momos. Sure. But I also want to efficiently get into consulting. Sure. I can't study too much sure. i don't want to uh, study for eight hours or ten hours on daily basis sure how can i spend my next three years if i want to work in the world of management consulting other than join gji sure. what else can they do sure it's a very good question and the fact that you're talking about a stephanian which mm -hmm. means that a premium tier one degree background is a privilege in itself why? Because McKinsey, BCG, Bain hire from these institutes. It opens already a lot of doors for you. So let me start with that. You are already sitting on gold. Mm -hmm. You are in a privileged ecosystem. But I'll be very candid. It will not come very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why these are McKinsey, BCG, Bains of the world. They are pretty prestigious. They, they just hire one or two people from campus, right? There are three ways of cracking this. The first one is the academic route. So, for example, my senior in St. Stephen's College was a university rank one. He was a CBSC rank one as well. Subhashish Padra, for example, we have partnered with his current organization as well. So, he went to... Is it Amitya Network? Oh, yeah, it was Amitya okay. Network, yes. So, and then he uh, joined, I think, another uh, venture capital fund. Uh, in my batch, for example, uh, the my colleague and uh, my acquaintance who got into McKinsey was not a rank one. In fact, we would famously joke he would barely get grades to pass, right? But he was an ace in getting internships. So the kind of internships he did with Deutsche Bank and many others were uh, really high class and top notch. Mm -hmm. The third way is that uh, you become a national cricketer mm -hmm. or a national hockey player. So in consulting, we say that there is something called as a spike. Spike is you're extraordinary. You're the top one percentage at a national level or in your own game. And consulting firms are looking for success achievers. Because if you have track record of success before, you will work with clients mm -hmm. and you will help them succeed as well. So it can either come through academics yeah. and that is a very rigorous route. It can come through extraordinary internships as well. Mm -hmm. In college, it could come if you are a leader of a prestigious club as well. So for example, in my year, 
uh, when McKenzie came, it shortlisted all the president of most of the clubs. And they would always, every year they will come and then they would change the algorithm of shortlist so that nobody could game them. Mm -hmm. But what they are trying to basically check is or find is people who are on the top of their game. Okay. Irrespective of the game you play. Got it. So can we segment this answer into two categories? Let's start with number one, how to get your CV shortlisted. Sure. That's number one. Correct. And stage two would be once you have your CV shortlisted, how do you make the cut? Sure. How do you get into and how do you get that high profile job offer? Sure. So stage one, how to get your CV shortlisted? Sure. It's a very good question and I would say there are two ways about it. One is the lazy way. I'll talk about it. We love the lazy way. All my wonderful subscribers, they love the lazy way. So go sure. on. The second one is the hardworking way. Hmm. I picked up the hardworking way during my St. Stephen's College uh, journey. I picked up the lazy way and I would not say the lazy way, the mm -hmm. astute way or the yeah. smart work way, right? So talking about the hard work, uh, for example, at ISP or for example, at St. Stephen's College, you need to be a Delhi University gold medalist or a hmm. gold medalist at ISP, you will get a shortlist. 99.9% wow. .9 chances are you will get a shortlist. Similarly, for example, when I was at ISP, I had really good experiences. For example, I had worked next to PMO in India. Yeah. I was working on really good, honorable Prime Minister's Good Governance Initiative, mm -hmm. uh, initiatives, etc. So that means that you have something on your CV that is worthy to be discussed. That's one way, right? So the other way or the network smart way. We all know of friends whereby their parents have been chief secretaries or bureaucrats, right? Yeah. They have arranged shortlists for their kids. That's one way. Now, not everyone will be friendly with the, or they might not be blessed to have bureaucrats who can get them shortlist, right? Or we know of friends whose parents were CEOs of uh, leading firms in India, then you can of course get a shortlist. But if you're people like you and Naman, right? Naman and me, were. Uh, you, you're not blessed in an ecosystem mm -hmm. or a privileged ecosystem like that. Mm -hmm. So for example, I was blessed to work with the McKinsey chairman for two years and he was really kind enough to help me put in a word for McKinsey, right? Yeah. That's how I got my final McKinsey offer as well. But I know of a lot of people who get a shortlist mm -hmm. through such word of mouth but don't get a final offer. Mm -hmm. And that is where I really, really like McKinsey, BCG and Bain. You can get shortlist through these word of mouth or through these network, mm -hmm. but eventually it's going to be your merit that will lead you to an offer. And we will talk about that yeah. interview stage also at a later stage. For BCG, for example, I networked myself through LinkedIn mm -hmm. and got a referral myself, etc. as well, which is a longer journey around how do you get a referral for yourself because I had worked with so many good bureaucrats, so many good politicians, mm -hmm. so many good C-suite uh, level people. Uh, it eventually made sense for one of the BCG senior partner to actually give me a referral as mm -hmm. well, which is the smarter way of going about things. And I think it takes a lot more runway. Mm -hmm. So if you're not having parents who are senior bureaucrats, mm -hmm. If you're not having parents who are CEOs mm -hmm. themselves, then you need a runway where you build your own credibility mm -hmm. through the network of the CEOs that you work with. Mm -hmm. So that new CEOs or new partners are happy to vouch for you. Mm -hmm. The Shatakshi or Naman needs a shortlist. They have done good work. Mm -hmm. That is what happened with me when I finally got my McKinsey and BCG offers. So that's my answer. Well, so to summarize, at least for the CV stage, there are two, two routes. The first is that, and I think in the end it's, a, it's just one route that you're leveraging your own internal network. It could be via your parents or via the networks that you, you build. You could come without a network also. That is the academic and the internship route, right? If hmm. you are a nine pointer or in uh, or if you are top one percentage academically, then without network you could crack it. But that's a very hard battle. Mm -hmm. And you pick the battle. So, for example, at ISB, I was competing against the IITNs of the world, the best brains, mm -hmm. right? I knew it's a battle I'm not going to win against them, right? I'm coming from a liberal arts institute. Yeah. So, I picked a battle that I could fight and I could win, Yeah. right? Uh, versus there could be few nerds who are watching the podcast and they might feel it's very easy for us mm -hmm. to actually come in the top one percentage in our batch. Mm -hmm. Then you fight that battle and you win it. But you know what your strengths are. Mm -hmm. You fight that battle and you win that. Wonderful. I love this aspect of, you know, figure out what are your strengths. Correct. Figure out what are your weaknesses and try to work on your strengths and minimize on your weaknesses. Correct. And it could be in any form that you can do. Sure. So that's the one way. Uh, now you've got the shortlist. Now, once you have the shortlist, as per my understanding, you will have to clear the, Correct. Uh, the case rounds. Right. And it doesn't matter whether your dad is the foreign secretary or the prime minister. In some cases, it might matter, <laughs> but largely that may not be the case. Sure. You will have to perform really well in the interviews. Sure. Now, how do you do that? Sure. And how do you prepare for it? 
Sure, it's a good question. So I'll have two part answer again to that. Uh, and I do want to re-emphasize what you just said. I know of people whose parents have been CEOs. I know of people whose parents have been foreign secretary and equivalent who got shortlist but got rejected at interview stage level. Okay. And that is where I hold MBB at least in really good light because they are highly meritocratic firms. So you will get a shortlist but you have to prove that your problem solving levels are beyond power at least at the level that they require. So I do want to re-emphasize on that. Now two part answer in terms of preparation. Point number one is a lot to do with are you sitting on campus or are you sitting outside of campus, right? In campus, you get a lot of buffer time, which is that, for example, in ISB, what happened with me was in August, I got a shortlist mm -hmm. for McKinsey and BCG. In November, my interviews were about to happen. That meant that I had a one, one and a half month of runway to prepare a lot of case studies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in many campuses, that this is a larger runway to have. In many campuses, the runway is of three to four weeks, not of one and a half months. So you get that runway. But in offline settings, uh, if in case you are getting a shortlist today, for example, for Dalberg, for FSG and for many other firms, mm -hmm. they will just call you for an interview next week or within three to four days. That means that your runway is relatively less. That means that the answer will depend from campus, on campus to off campus. Mm -hmm. Now, the answer within campus also changes. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm structuring like a quintessential management consultant. Mm -hmm. On campus, what really happens is if you're an undergrad, Many a times you are not expected to know business jargons and business language. Mm -hmm. You are just expected to know problem solving. But if you know business jargons and business language and you can interlink can the help. world of business Obviously, with... Obviously, right? Okay. That's why, for example, for a very long period of time, in my college, in St. Stephen's College, economic students had a better advantage of getting into yes. consulting rather than mathematics or chemistry students, right? Uh, so we had to upskill ourselves informally way more than the economic students had to do, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but if you are a working professional, which you are in a business school, you are expected to know business concepts, mm -hmm. right? And this logic applies to off-campus also. If you have two to three years of experience, you're sitting in a consulting interview, you're expected to understand what is a business model, mm -hmm. what is a profitability equation, how do you go about building go-to-market strategies, etc., right? Mm -hmm. In an undergrad, for example, at IIT Delhi College, where there is no economics, mm -hmm. right? Either you are civil or you are mechanical or you are electrical. If you know it, it's an icing on the cake. But if you don't know it, you can still problem solve structurally and systemically well. You are really good. But for example, in Bain and Company, the situation changes. Bain does a lot of due diligence. So private equity cases, which required way more business sense mm -hmm. than other cases, you are supposed to. So a lot of answer is tailored. So that's my answer on on campus, which is that either you are at an undergrad level or you are at a postgrad level. Okay. And in terms of case preparation, what really happens is if you get a shortlist, then you get mapped with buddies from people on the campus, right? Mm -hmm. What will happen is, for example, McKinsey will give you two buddies, BCG will give you two buddies, so on and so forth. Then you, for example, if you got a BCG shortlist, I got a McKinsey shortlist, mm -hmm. you will have your BCG buddies from BCG and right. I will have my McKinsey. We will also do cases. Uh, it is typically advisable that you do 30 to 60 cases. Yeah individually, not by reading verbatim. Mm -hmm. It's like a math. It's a muscle that you will have to build, right? You do case studies. You learn how to communicate well. You learn how to divide problems. It's a much more systemic way. So in a 30 minute setting, you mm -hmm. go about solving profitability problem, mergers and acquisition problem, go to market strategy problem, cost optimization problem, so on and so forth. Similarly, off campus, you have to do this, mm -hmm. but I always suggest people mm -hmm. who are applying off campus that do not start your case prep mm -hmm. after the shortlist. Then you're doomed mm -hmm. because you have just three, four days to sit for the interview. You're actually competing with others. So Correct. When you compete with others, you have to be a little better Correct. than the others. You need to have a strategic advantage. Yeah. So if you're applying, you're sharpening your CV already on an off campus mode, please start practicing cases and most importantly, be comfortable with finance, operations, marketing industry, so that you can interlink things. Ma management consulting is a classic industry and a sector. We don't think in silos. That's why you get management consultants. They have fresh perspective. They yeah. can interlink things. So you need to be not just good with case solving, yeah. especially if you're a working professional. You need to have business understanding to be able to apply those concepts to real problems. Oh, that's wonderful. I think uh, a very good friend of mine, he 
is uh, a cons- I think he recently got promoted as a partner in the New York office uh, of McKinsey. I think they were doing some hiring from this college in the US called Bates College. Sure. And uh, in fact, he told me the same thing that uh, interlinking is critical. And one of the candidates that they eventually hired was someone who had no background in business. Sure. But was able to talk about, let's say, positive deviance theory and link it with the world of business so beautifully well right. that she even communicated that um, impeccably well. Because at the end of the day, uh, once you have that basic level of uh, intelligence, you can definitely be of extreme relevance to those specific organizations. I completely agree. So totally concur with that. So for example, if I were to share an anecdote, in my McKinsey second round interview, the partner who was interviewing me eventually complimented me on that. It was actually a case about setting up uh, a capital city of a southern state, of course, I knew it was Andhra Pradesh uh, case that he was teaching me about. So he actually complimented me on a skill of interlinking. Very interestingly, the kind of cases that are thrown in US offices versus India offices, US offices check for way more proactive interlinking. Mm -hmm. They will have three subsections to a case. And many times when you're solving the third section, Mm -hmm. you will have to interlink what just happened in the first section. And it is very easy to assume that, oh, I'll do it. (laughs) But when you're in that moment and you have a clock ticking Mm -hmm. uh, and you really want that job, it is very hard to do it uh, as well because things are, that's why it's problem solving, right? So I'm completely with you. And uh, this has also been my realization even at GJI. So folks who were able to get the McKinsey, BCG, Bain offers were those who were very diligent in various aspects of GJI. They were, they were learning philosophy, yes. they were learning data analytics, they were learning communications, platforms, so on and so forth. And eventually, within a structure, they were able to beautifully articulate a, a wonderful narrative when, it was, when they were solving cases. I agree. So, yeah, interlinking is critical. So just to summarize both the points, first about the shortlist and second about the cracking the interviews the lazy way. Please do that. Sure. In terms of shortlist, we are basically saying that you need four things. Mm -hmm. Either you get your ACADs right, or you have a spike in experiences, or you have a spike in extracurricular, or you build a fantastic network who can refer you. That's Mm -hmm. the shortlist section. Within the case uh, interview section, there are further two synthesis. Mm -hmm. I didn't touch upon the second part yet, but in the case part, you need to prepare 40 to 60 mocks in a real life setting. Mm -hmm. You need to know business concepts. Uh, You ideally start preparing for them the moment you start doing the shortlists uh, if you are applying for CVs. And there is a personal interview round as well where they check for a fit. Are you a good fit for McKinsey, BCG and Bain? Mm -hmm. So that aspect you will of course have to get right as well. Management consulting is very much of a team member game. Yeah. They are not just looking for a bunch of nerds who can solve for a problem on a piece of paper. They are looking for people who can look into your eyes sharply mm-hmm. and give you an advice point point blank with a very good data point. Right. Absolutely. So they are checking for those soft skills also. How do you introduce yourself? Can you do it succinctly? Can you divide the problem uh, verbally in two points as well? Mm-hmm. So that section is very important that many people miss out on. Wow. So this is the first aspect. Now let's come to the very interesting part. So let's assume that I made many mistakes in my life. In class 12th, I was chilling. I was uh, not studying well. And eventually ended up getting into, let's say, Daudaram College of Engineering. And now, later in, in second year or third year, I realized there's, there's something called management consulting. It pays a lot. It also allows me to work across disciplines. Sure. It also cro- allows me to build a great alumni network and learn skills, so on and so forth. Now, I've already made the mistakes. <laughs> I'm not from a target school sure. that will let, land me into the world of consulting. Sure. And so I think in my mind, for me, getting into consulting is not possible. Sure. But I will give myself five years, let's say, or sure. four years. And with a dream that I would want to work in McKinsey or BCG, how can I do that? That's a very good question. Two part answer. First part is it's possible in the medium term, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is... And by medium term, you mean four years? Four to five years, correct. Uh, People just lose patience very quickly. They just want quick answers. Mm -hmm. It should happen right now, right? Uh, We should know that career is a marathon. It's not a sprint, Mm -hmm. right? And that is where you should over index on your learning, on your network, etc. So, for example, I worked with a CEO of nearby 
which was eventually nearby was acquired by Paytm. He was an ex-Carni consultant. I worked with a boutique consulting firm run by two ex-McKinsey's. I worked with the former chairman of McKinsey and Company. I know of peers who were surrounding me who didn't come from St. Stephen's College of the World, mm -hmm. right? What I mean to say is that you find jobs where your bosses mm -hmm. are ex-consultants. Ex what that will do to you will be two things. Mm -hmm. Over a period of time, you will build a network. Perhaps they can refer you after some time, all right? Or they can introduce you to friends who are still working in consulting. That's one. Mm -hmm. Second, at a skill set level, you will start learning problem solving way early in your life. Mm -hmm. Rather than just thinking that eventually over a period of time, you will pick up case solving, etc. So that's the first route. And over a period of time, after five to six years, and I know of so many GGINs, for example, mm -hmm. they pivoted into boutique consulting firm first. Yeah. After four to five years, and then over a period of time, they are now planning to get into MBB also, Makes right? Yeah. So that's first path. The second path is, for example, the formal MBA path as well. Once again, that also doesn't come with guarantees. Mm -hmm. In Bain, in McKinsey, in DCG also, my year, I know of people who didn't come from really flamboyant undergrads, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they once again got the shortlist through the four step method I just explained before, right? So they got the shortlist, they got everything right and they got into management consulting MBB. But once again, it's a selective sample. Yeah. I also know of friends in ISB yeah. who didn't come from flamboyant or tier one academic institute who also didn't get into consulting. Wow. So formal MBA will never guarantee you a seat. Yeah. It is just one of the platform or an ecosystem. So at ISB, if I were to give rough stats, there were 600 people on Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. There are 300 people in Mohali, 900 batch. Everyone wants to get into consulting. Roughly 100 people will get into the top premium consulting firms, including LEK and Parthan and etc. Mm -hmm. That means that 800 people don't get into consulting. They get into good jobs, mm -hmm. product management, marketing, etc, etc. Mm -hmm. So at ISB, the absolute number looks big, but the percentage cohort getting into management consulting is relatively less. So for example, tuck your school, mm -hmm. relative percentage selection into management consulting goes really very high. And I think that's also because the cohort size is small. Mm -hmm. So those are the two paths through which someone who is in the final year of undergrad from tier 3 or tier 4 academic institute over a medium term can build a roadmap for himself or herself mm -hmm. to get into management consulting. Sounds, sounds there could be more creative ideas, yeah. but based on my experiences, those are the two paths that I could think of. Sounds wonderful. I think so in the short term, an engineer from Daduram College. Is there something called Daduram College? I have College? no idea, but let's say, you know, I don't. I don't want to name any specific sure, college, no, and therefore that, yeah. I'm, I'm coming up with an innovative name. Sure. So let's and say Dadi Ram College. Yeah, let's be gender neutral. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so they can in the short term they can work on two things. They can work on their skills because eventually you need to be prepared if you sure. were to given an opportunity. Um, so learn the skill sets across disciplines, refine your businesses, refine your pub public policy understanding, refine your communications aspects. And in the meantime, also figure out a way and means to work with ex-consultants. Correct. So that you can also have a good consulting experience Correct. or do fellowships like the GJ Impact Fellowship or so on and so forth. So that I you have some something to talk about in your consulting interview. If I just want happens. to add one more thing and that's one of the primary reasons why many employees came to work with us also at GGI. As an exit opportunity outside of working at GGI, they got into Bain Management Consulting. They, one of them got into McKinsey. Another got into, two of them got into Boutique Management Consulting. So there are perks of working with founders who are from Management Consulting as well because they have a certain style of thinking. Mm -hmm. And they create an ecosystem where the team also picks up that uh, style of thinking. Absolutely. Reminds me of all the good times when you worked with those wonderful people to design a tool called Schrodinger. What yes. is that? And how can that help you get into consulting? So that's a very good uh, example. Schrodinger is Schrodinger's cat, the famous Schrodinger's cat uh, mm -hmm. scientist experiment. So at GGI, it's a live and interactive ecosystem for MBA scholars, for policy scholars and for impact fellows. But you and I, we both realize that this scale cannot be achieved at GGI. Mm -hmm. And hence, we wanted to really teach people how to get into consulting at scale. Yeah. And we realize I have 24 hours and you have 24 hours and my friends from McKenzie, BCG, Bain, we have limited hours, right? Mm -hmm. So what can be done? So I collected all my friends' brains from McKenzie, BCG, Bain and my brain my included. Mm -hmm. We created an AI tool mm -hmm. through which all of our intelligence has been fed into an wow. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Whereby, for example, if you are an aspirant of management consulting, you want to practice cases. 
right you do not even know how does a case look like how does a consulting mock look like mm-hmm. you do not even know how to solve also a consulting case mock so we uh, built an ai based software on which 12 at your midnight without the help of a mentor without even the need of a human being you can just start practicing cases and based on your response the machine will change the next question that come to you so think of also like gmat gmat is an adaptive exam based on your current answer your next question will change so it's an adaptive mock interview platform based on your responses the next question will change at the end you get a score evaluative score and you also get a feedback you also find solutions so that you build that business brain on how you can start learning problem solving mm-hmm. and how you can crack consulting cases so that's shodinger that of course now gjns have access to oh that's wonderful and i think we were doing this little uh, so eventually it all boils down to outcomes and outputs so no education platform can be of relevance if we do not measure the outcomes and the outputs sure which shodinger we have realized that if you can solve cases like three times or four times i think twice is also fine but i've seen that people you know when when they do it for multiple times the results you know it, it just exponentially right. improves you do few things but of course you need more practice as well mm-hmm. because it's it's like a math muscle the more problems you solve the more kind of thoughts you will get but quality is also really very yeah. important if you just read 60 cases mm-hmm. then it's worth none but the quality of just even doing one hard problem twice mm-hmm. is also th- that worth is also very high wow so uh, this is fascinating shatakshi so isha ambani she went to stanford sure. and then she joined mckinsey right right mitt romney joined bain you had the offer from both mckinsey and bcg and like you mentioned that right after the in stevens you you interviewed with mckinsey not sure about bcg why did you pick bcg over mckinsey after an mba sure it's a very good question i get this very often myself as well i believe two part answer the first part so of the was answer was the book out already <laughs> no that's not true okay um bcg at least during my time and that's true till date i am someone who derives a lot of my energy by doing a lot of social impact work as well after working with adil zainul bhai who's the former chairman of mckinsey i saw that there was a clear value add that he was bringing to the table in government which was that he knew the way private sector worked he knew the way how efficiencies and productivity were brought into private sector and hence government officers really valued him uh, because he knew the other side of the table that meant that my motivation of working in management consulting was to know private sector that's mm-hmm. point number 1 okay. but i just didn't want to do private sector only i knew that i'm someone who will get a lot of motivation work satisfaction if i do public sector and social impact work as well mm-hmm. bcg for example right now is number 1 management consulting in india by value of revenue mm-hmm. uh, they are doing way more government projects they are doing way more social impact work so for example in my second year of bcg i was just doing public sector work and mm-hmm. social impact work Uh, I know of examples in McKinsey of a lot of people who wanted to do social impact work and government sector work. They couldn't find projects within McKinsey. They couldn't even find, and that's not me belittling McKinsey. I'm sure there are smarter people running McKinsey, and they have their own reason why they are doing whatever they are doing. But for people like us who derive work satisfaction at the intersection of private sector and social impact more, I didn't see a career for myself in McKinsey way more than I could see it for BCG. Mm-hmm. of course needless to say had i just gotten mckinsey offer and not bcg offer eyes closed i would have picked it it's a fantastic firm it has a legacy of itself mm-hmm. that meant that i wanted to build a career with bcg that's point number 1 where i could work on both private sector learn the efficiencies of private sector now mm-hmm. and get work satisfaction by working on public sector projects second because i had myself built a lot of good mckinsey network by working with the former chairman of mckinsey and company mm-hmm. i wanted to expand my network because i knew back then that i am going to become an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and today for example we are so blessed that the chairman of mckinsey sitting mm-hmm. the former chairman of bcg uh, the chairman of henderson institute in us mm-hmm. they've all come and taught at our education gji right uh, that means that we were successful in leveraging the network right Absolutely. and we have also given back hugely to bcg in terms of goodwill and in terms of i if someone asks me mckinsey over bcg i i'd honestly tell them bcg because i also found one more thing and i think mm-hmm. that's an answer in the hindsight i didn't know going into bcg the culture of bcg is really of humble people mm-hmm. 
good humble middle class people mm -hmm. who have made it big in life mm -hmm. i've been told i could be absolutely wrong in this one i've told many a times mm -hmm. that be, i can see people have a chip on their shoulder it mm -hmm. could be true it could be wrong as well mm -hmm. uh, i have not experienced the firm myself first person but the culture in bcg was very much humble mm -hmm. nobody shouted nobody had a chip on their shoulder people mm -hmm. were humble they came at your level helped you understand things mm -hmm. and uh, that just made it a much more uh, positive ecosystem to work in and who designs better ppts mckinsey or bcg i would say that i don't know the answer to that question you and i both know i despised ppt one of the main reason i left mm -hmm. so yes okay i'm glad that you spoke briefly about the term called middle class sure and um, in the past few years i have realized that uh, for indians for middle class indians for lower middle class indians there are three asymmetric bets that they can play in life if they want to skyrocket their career sure the first bet is that you prepare for civil services sure if you crack the exam your generations can change correct second bet is you become politician sure <laughs> again you know your generations can again change sure the third bet that many of these youngsters can play is to establish and build a career in management consulting sure why why is that the case and how can a career in management consulting transform the life of a low middle class to middle class household sure i'll just add one more thing to it which is our bread and butter our primary way of earning things which is entrepreneurship so you can become from a middle class I, to I, upper I middle i spoke about india but of course india is now changing sure. and thankfully so we are catching up to the to the entrepreneurial culture of sure. the silicon valleys right and i hope this this goes on forever sure but uh, i cautiously avoided choosing the word entrepreneurship because uh, many consultants they going to become entrepreneurs eventually sure sure so yeah that's it's but off to you um, sure. same same question i i think it's a very good question and i remember in my final bcg round they were asking also about what does my father do what do my siblings do etc etc there are few gates in life which are reserved for few right so for example you took an example of upsc right it's a binary answer either you crack it or you don't crack it the selection is less than 1% if you are not in that 1% unfortunately you are doomed right uh, until unless you become a teacher then you get into that life cycle similarly with politician right mm -hmm. uh, the window of getting successful is less either a politician or you are not a politician right there is no i nothing in between what i'm trying you to say you can be a politician but um, at a think, lower level right yeah. it doesn't really help you in terms of cracking from middle class to upper middle class of course so what i'm trying to say with management consulting is the salary moves like a hockey stick and management consulting is not that just mckinsey bcg and bain there are so many other management consulting firms and what really happens is uh, for example in my year at bcg the starting salary was 33 then at a pl level project manager level you start earning 50 at a partner or a principal level at a principal level or at an associate partner level you start making somewhere around 70 to 80 it would have double as of now right or is it it still? would have double okay. so i think the starting salary at bcg from isb somewhere around 40 41 wow. right uh, that means that it always catches up to the industry or the inflation so the salary literally moves like a hockey stick versus what really happens is in other jobs you move linearly mm -hmm. right that means that the slope is pretty bad mm -hmm. you are just getting 7 percentage growth on your salary or 8 percentage best case 15 percentage mm -hmm. but here you are literally doing 2x and 3x on your salary mm -hmm. so if you make it through hard work and the window is not very narrow to get into management consulting it is relatively large right and it is not that if after engineering college i couldn't become a management consultant then i could never become a management consultant mm -hmm. after 4 years you could also become a management consultant and within 4 years you're not unemployed mm -hmm. unlike a upsc aspirant mm -hmm. that if you are preparing or preparing mm -hmm. otherwise you're not doing anything most of the people take a career break that from that perspective i'm talking about right similarly for politician right so it's true that a middle class person who makes into consulting does really very well mm -hmm. because the salary moves like a hockey stick mm -hmm. that's point number 1 but of course the hours are more as well let's not discount that and point number 2 is even if you, it takes more runway for you to crack that industry mm -hmm. you're still earning you're doing well for yourself you're not sitting idle and you're not making money for yourself for your family so that's my answer so once you start earning salaries um like the hockey stick what about the experiences Sure. Um, do management consultants spend a lot of their time working, <laughs> uh, working 
And are always on the back and call of the client? Sure. Are they designing PPTs? Are they always on phone calls or Zoom calls or sure. office team calls, sure. whatever? Or do they also have time to engage in their personal activities? What's sure. the work-life balance look like for a management consultant? So it depends from geography to geography. In India, I'll be very candid, it's pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Indian standpoint, I could also say that work-life balance in management consulting is a myth. <laughs> it does not exist. There are people who have written to me as well that I want to get into management consulting. I want to earn good salary, but I just want to work 50 hours a week. You can't solve for everything in management consulting, mm-hmm. right? You solve for good experience, you solve for good salary, but you don't solve for hours, unfortunately so. If you want to solve for hours, either you don't get into it or you do it for a few years, you gain the experience or you move out someone like me, right? But for example... What if I start my career in India? And in a couple of years, I would want to move to a geography where Correct. work-life balance is valued. So How can I do that? Only top firms, MBB, have international expansion, international offices. The top 10 percentage, I think top 10 percentage to 20 percentage is able to successfully move geographies. So they also allow and give that reward of moving geography to the top performers, right? Okay. That means that you would have to hustle really hard <laughs> for you to actually move geographies. Okay. If you move to geography like Netherlands or Nordic countries, or not so famous offices of US. So for example, New York and San Francisco offices are pretty hustled, right? Mm -hmm. But if you move to other offices in US, then it is going to be better for you. At least that's what has been told by a lot of my friends who moved geographies. So that is largely my answer when it comes to uh, managing hours. You work a lot, Uh, you get a lot of good experiences. I've been boardroom meetings. Uh, with a lot of leading FMCG CEOs in this country. I many a time say that I've learned more from those CEOs than many of the partners because they were entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They build businesses. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to build businesses. So I learned a lot how they were thinking about problems. Uh, How much frugal were they? Mm -hmm. Even if they were sitting on multi-crore businesses, Mm -hmm. they were still frugal about decisions. So uh, you get a lot of good decision-making practices. You learn how people question each and everything from consultants. Gone are the days where consultants would just publish a PPT and everything would be accepted at face value. Mm -hmm. I once had a uh, client who was a CXO, who was an IIM Ahmedabad gold medalist. He would question each and every statistical analysis we would do. So consulting is not pretty easy that you will just do some fancy PPT work and everything will be accepted. Mm -hmm. Especially in today's day and age, clients are pretty uh, interestingly smart, which is actually allows us to be on the edge. Could you also help the audience understand the difference between the back-end consultant and the front-end consultant? Sure. Because there are many folks who start their career in back-end consulting and eventually move forward to become front-end consultants. Sure. What's the difference between the salaries, the perks, the experiences, so on and so forth? Sure. The difference is stark. The main difference is of client. Mm -hmm. That impacts your communication skills, that impacts your personality skills, that impacts your time management skills as well and largely your problem-solving skills as well. So, for example, at BCG, We had back-end support team that meant that many a times on heavy research intensive cases, I didn't have to collect the data myself. Mm -hmm. All I had to do was to make framework on a neat Excel, send it to the back-end team and ask them to actually fill the entire Excel with information. Mm -hmm. On few occasions, I would actually bring this out. So do back-end folks with the boring work? Unfortunately, (laughs) yes. I will actually bring out more nuances in it. There were few back-end research consultants who got back to me and made few advisory on the framework also. Shatakshi, you could add this and you could add that, which is something that I really loved. Uh, Over a period of time, they start getting mapped to partners. So, for example, if there is an industrial good partners, Mm -hmm. right? Why are you a partner? Because you have an expertise in the industry. Your expertise comes from knowledge. So, typically, these partners associate themselves with few back-end consultants so that they can request any data as and when they're meeting new clients, mm-hmm. right? Clients will not expect partners to not be up to date with the up to date with the information. So that's one key information that I wanted to bring out. You don't fly, uh, you don't get to live in fancy restaurants. Your salary, of course, doesn't move as much as a hockey stick curve. You don't get to solve problems so much. Fancy you do hotels, write. not restaurants, because in restaurants they can stay. In fancy restaurants ones. stay. <laughs> Sure. So, of course, like I I was telling you, most of the times I was not even looking at the menu, uh, the rate. Mm -hmm. We were just ordering. After a point of time, it kind of gets boring. Back-end consultants do write a lot of interesting reports with partners. So, they will pick up an industry. They will write economic reports, economics report. They will write reports about the industry. There, they will get to actually experience some bit of problem solving. Mm -hmm. That if you have to... uh, 
and all these management consulting organization want to have a say they want to showcase to the world that we have an expertise or a thought leadership on a certain sector mm -hmm. that is where a lot of back end researcher workers also come into position front end consultants many a times if it is that report is of strategic importance mm -hmm. front end consultants take a lot of front seat on that work as well right. now for example bain and company which has a back end called bain capability center they hire back end research folk or mid office folks uh from st stevens and iit of the world as well mm -hmm. to my view and i don't have first uh, first point experience i think they do way more quality back end work than mckinsey bcgs of the world right the bcg back end researcher and a front end consultant mm -hmm. the mckinsey back end and a front end consultant have way more delta in their skill set mm -hmm. have way more delta in their work quality and salary than a bain one has and especially in bain especially in bain it is way more probable for you to move from bain capability center which is your back end to your front end office got it so initially you mentioned that if i come from a tier 3 or tier 2 college in the short term it's little difficult for me and in some cases makes it impossible for me to sure. work make in cbcg pain right but how feasible would would it be for that person to work as a back end consultant in these organizations very feasible i know of a lot of people who work in mckinsey i know of a lot of peers in bcg who are doing back end research work who came from tier 3 tier 2 academic institutes mm -hmm. uh, in many cases mbbs and many other i think largely back end office exists for mbbs only because they have the wealth and the money to have a back end office infrastructure and that's why in boutique consulting firms you have to do research also you have to make ppts also in bcg also i made I did both of them in most of the times but we did have support. So on campus placements also these folks come. But the answer to your question is very if you write to right people on LinkedIn also senior managers in back end team mm -hmm. uh, if you come from tier 3 background if you have done good quality internships also there is mm -hmm. a high likelihood that your chances could be considered. So you could still get exposed to that world of right. consulting mm -hmm. but from a back end point of view which is not bad to actually start with. This is extremely relevant, sure. and I'm so glad that we're having this conversation because it's going to be enormously beneficial for all the viewers. Sure. Um, another question that I will have for you, and many many consultants and many future aspirants will have for you, is that you know I got into consulting. I worked really hard, did my cases, solved Schrodinger multiple times, learned things from across disciplines, and performed very diligently in my academics. Had those spikes on as a path. But now I'm bored of consulting in 2 years. I would want to take up new projects. So sure. are there secondment opportunities for these consul these consultants be it in the UN, be it in the WEF or so on and so forth? Many. In fact, that's one of the retention strategy of management consultants, um, management consulting organizations especially for their top quartile performers. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Bain, for example, they have Britspan also, which is their sister non-profit organization, which advises non-profits. It does amazing work in the it, in the social impact space. Correct, right? Uh, they also have similar secondments. So, for example, at BCG, we had World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. we had uh, Cry, and a lot of leading organization non-profits in London as well. Mm -hmm. The top performers would typically consider them. It allowed them to also kind of got a break from consulting because the hours were hectic, etc. So. Uh, similar is with mckinsey as well so secondments are actually very good tool for management consulting organization to build relationship mm -hmm. with those organizations yeah. because those organizations would have been clients in some shape or other format so they get permanent staff for some period of time on a regular ongoing basis with mm -hmm. whom they could not just solve projects projects but get other strategic work also done on an ad hoc basis yeah. and it's a fantastic way for them to also retain really good quality talent as well Oh, that's wonderful. I think I was talking to a friend of mine, Naveen. Uh, he is uh, the health secretary currently in the Andhra government, and hopefully his podcast will come out soon as well. Sure. Or might have come out already. So he also mentioned that uh, as a government of India, it is extremely relevant that even government does this collaborations with uh, external organizations. Sure. Unfortunately, that's not happening. But sure. it's one of the recommendations that uh, many many civil servants have. for the government and i hope that that taken take, that gets taken care of sure so in this podcast we speak a lot about plan b for civil services because for for obvious reasons upsc is a little uncertain exam unpredictable public service commission and uh, many youngsters think and have this view that if not the ias i will become a dsp or a deputy collector sure or i will appear for various 
you know state civil services examinations to become a tehsildar or whatever but i always tend to say this that if your dream was to become a collector become if your dream was to become an ifs become an ifs or a collector don't settle for you know a, a lower rank category in the same services sure. because it will take up at least 14 to 15 to 20 years sure. to then become a collector sure. and along the journey you would realize that uh, you're frustrated i agree you are you are cribbing and 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 reporting to someone who had just cleared an exam that you dreamt of clearing sure so for them i think the plan b incredible plan b could be to explore a career in the un or in mckinsey's and bcg's and the and the world bank i agree and in this way they can also live a life which is tier 1 sure and they can also leverage the alumni network that these tier 1 organizations provide i agree and with this you can also sc- carve out your own journey yes so in this context i want to talk about this uh, the alumni network that these organizations have built and how relevant or irrelevant is the alumni network of the bcg or or mckinsey or bain sure it's a fantastic question because naman i genuinely believe especially with mbb and i don't want to come across as someone who's obsessed with mbb but it is a club uh it is a club which is equivalent of harvard stanford of the world uh in fact i've told this many a times that my alums from bcg alumni network of bcg has turned out to be for now way more helpful than my isb club till now uh of course isb has also helped us a great deal uh chairmen's partners peers they have all gone out of their way to help in my entrepreneurial ambitions i have also gone out of my way and help them in their ambition we understand that we are as good as the collaborative institute it is hard to get into that club you have a collaborative mindset there is a shared experience also a club is as good as there is consistent shared experience yeah. right so even if your projects would have been different even if your geographies would have been different there is still that partner culture so if i meet someone from mexico from bcg or even from mckinsey the we would have that shared experience of a partner culture of a case of making ppt of talking in two points etc and having that uh experience of how we even got into the firm would have been pretty much shared even though we would have lived it independently and personally uh, differently so that shared experiences really bring people together and there is this culture of helping each other really really well for example there is north american bcg alumni meeting that i attend virtually many a times when we were in us i attended it in person as well in india for example there was a delhi alumni meeting that happened after 3 years after a pandemic break mm-hmm. uh, i wanted to attend it i couldn't because i was not in delhi but perhaps next time but needless to say the club of mbb is unlike many others it's actually in many ways almost uh, better than harvard or perhaps as equal than harvard so that's what my advice will be wow and we spoke at length about the mbbs but how are mbbs different from let's say kpmg deloitte and the ilks that sure. we didn't cover in this uh, in the past few minutes sure. so what's the difference between a career in a consulting career in deloitte or kpmg versus the one in the mbbs sure i would say it's not really largely different apart from the fact that it's really hard to get into mbb because of the selection rate uh, i say this often your salary will be higher in mbb but so will your hours be it's a smaller team in mbb trying to solve for a larger case mm-hmm. in a similar case in eny um, or kpmg or the big four a larger team will be deployed so your per team team member hours will go less but so your salary will be at a work quality level is somewhere where i have seen a large stark difference as someone who has worked in boutique consulting and who has worked in bcg also i realize the level of rigor that bcg will put before making any advice is way way higher in consulting we say there is triangulation of data mm-hmm. that you don't give an answer with just one data mm-hmm. you will find verification of that answer from second source from third source also so the rigor that you put in finding the same answer is just very high and i think this legacy also of these firms they know that the penalty of getting an answer wrong starkly off is just very high like you were talking about mckinsey for example came in news for the bad news right of being involved in opm and many other cases so uh, at least in bcg i saw that culture of getting the answer right really really well that's one thing and second the kind of projects that you could work i worked on climate impact sustainability government projects it projects 
and the kind of infrastructural support also we had so for example in bcg we had uh, a consumer insight uh, survey team which helped us with a lot of data directly we had back end research support team we had die team which is technological driven uh, in larger firms like obviously so you have way bigger infrastructure to support that decision making support that advisory then an mbb mbb largely started as an accounting firm which happened to get into advisory think of M the, sorry big firm yeah. uh mbb on the other hand started as a consulting firm and mm. still keeps consulting at the heart of things and this is the reason why mbps are so nitpicky about specific colleges specific brands and that may not be the case with deloitte and the pwcs of the world could be there is a famous study that was done by mckinsey in i think 1980s or i think before that which is that they created an entire story about talent mm -hmm. and it was it kind of re Uh, re-emphasize their own hiring strategy they told clients that you need to hire from certain college and they will actually be the ones who will take your organization from 100 to 1 1 billion mm -hmm. and they sold that entire story really very well to their own firm and to the clients that it has become a culture overall that's a club you allow selective people mm -hmm. and you make their selective people really rich but those selective people have to work really very hard mm -hmm. and have to hustle a lot so it's a model mm -hmm. that model has worked really very well it's like a harvard culture mm -hmm. right you have 500 seats mm -hmm. but those 500 people will do really well and they will earn a lot of good wealth as well so it's a similar selective exclusive club model that has worked really well for mbps as well wow so let's move on to the last segment of this wonderful podcast with sure. you and in this last last segment i would want to learn about your perspectives your views on the future of consulting sure it is often said that we have like 25 years old kids advising the stalwarts in the industry sure in some way or the other many have raised questions sure many have wrongfully rightfully sure. said a lot of things about this number one what are your thoughts on this sure aspect where you don't have skin in the game sure and second is what is going to be the future of consulting sure It's a very good question. In fact, I remember the CEO of BCG India during my onboarding and induction addressed this question head on. Many people question this. Surprisingly, this model works, and this model works is because a lot of it about consulting has nothing to do with expert knowledge. Mm -hmm. Has a lot to do with data rigor wow. and problem solving. If it was about expert knowledge, then experts are already sitting with the client, right? It is a lot about first principle problem solving, and if clients can do first principle problem solving, then I agree you don't need management consultants in the world I'm not trying to glorify it but the model does work that's point number 1 point number 2 in terms of future of management consulting I believe it's a two part answer one is horizontal and the second one is vertical horizontal in terms of functions tech is going to play a very important role a lot of clients are asking problems which has either tech problem or mm -hmm. the solution is sitting with tech okay. i think accenture for example has a very strong strategic advantage there because they have a good accenture tech arm bcg for example has introduced a die arm which is digital analytics and doing an entire overall around digital implementation for clients i'm sure bain and mckinsey will so yeah mckinsey has acquired a few companies working in this space as well sure. yeah so that is one arm where everyone realizes and not just in consulting tech is massively disrupting every stage either ig or cg so that's one second is climate impact and sustainability uh, you cannot advance an organization today by shying away mm -hmm. from the collective mission of our planet mm -hmm. which is not just capitalism but responsive capitalism mm -hmm. which is that i have been in boardroom with client meetings whereby either the ceos themselves were asking questions about client mm -hmm. or if they were not asking i have seen bcg partners and senior partners pushing them a little bit in the right direction but that he don't just care about shareholder value maximization mm -hmm. care about stakeholder value maximization as well so that's the vertical topic climate impact and sustainability so those are two larger topics mm -hmm. where uh, consulting will move towards uh, consultants are already trend setters they mm -hmm. set forecast it's another thing mm -hmm. how much do those forecast turns out to be to not just for consulting mm -hmm. i think forecasting as an industry overall mm -hmm. 90% is turns out to be false mm -hmm. then true but uh, these trends we are already seeing right now so it's not in future mm -hmm. we have to just build the infrastructure more strongly for the future but uh, yes those will be my two point answer for well, one last question and uh, this is again picked up from your term of forecasters sure so i don't know this is a very famous story about uh, the civilizational history of india 
that there was a village and in that village there were like four sets of people the first one were the merchants who traded second were for the farmers who grew crops sure third were artisans who or craftsmen who designed sure. beautiful things and fourth one for the folks who advised and amongst all those can you take a guess who earned the most advisory why is that the case why are advisors always paid enormously well engineers will create things Med- medical doctors will go on to cure medicines cure your diseases but eventually at least in the early stages of career and then the hockey stick kicks in advisors or the consultants they get, they get paid enormously why does that happen i think it's a function of being a mule in life versus being pick any animal which is smart right uh, so human <laughs> yes so uh, i think naval ravikant famously said this that if you want to earn wealth mm-hmm. uh, don't over index on your hours pick mm-hmm. a leverage skill set right pick a niche skill set that you can do and no one else can do it better than you in a knowledge economy knowledge is power and in advisory many a times uh, you will have access to an information that others will not have in an information asymmetric society mm-hmm. if you know things that others don't then you will earn more uh, but i think the society is changing a little bit engineers are earning more mm-hmm. product managers are also earning more i believe uh, there are professions who have been left behind they should earn more as well mm-hmm. but as long as in any society one percentage of the people only one percentage of the people will have a skill mm-hmm. that is very much demanded mm-hmm. that one percentage will continue to earn a lot of wealth absolutely i'll correct my thoughts uh, engineers do earn a lot <laughs> the good ones yes and yes. product managers are usually the consultants in some way or the other the sure. many ceos so it was an absolute privilege shatakshi to have you in this podcast and thank you so much for sharing your journey uh, in the world of management consulting i'm fairly optimistic that this podcast will be of extreme relevance to all the youngsters who are flirting with the idea of establishing a meaningful career in the world of management consulting or public policy or social impact consulting and i think uh, given the wisdom that you had shared uh we would want to invite you again if and when that happens to tell you other aspects of the consulting uh any last words and thoughts for the audience um i'm more than honored and thank you so much naman you asked really valid question from how the industry works how do you get in and what could be the future and salaries and hours of course my last two cents will be uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about this topic which is mental well being mm-hmm. it is very much important uh, while rushing for your career getting anxious for your career being ambitious uh, are bound to happen one should have them i think that is how you advance your career but do know that in that entire journey you don't lose access to your mental well being mental health uh, decline cases are on the rise ever since the pandemic has taken place so please make sure that uh, people who are watching this keep their your closed ones by your side uh, in this world of internet where everyone's salaries are out there in the open mm-hmm. it is okay to earn a little bit less but have a lot of good mental health and with that uh, i would also like to thank you again for having me wow thank you so much i think a very famous consultant once said confucius that uh, i think uh, so a healthy person has millions of dreams but an unhealthy, unhealthy person has just one dream to be healthy yeah so yeah take care of your health and i wish you all the very best and um, enjoy the day thank you ciao bye